everybody. Uh, this is Stern's Stories. I am Caitlin Carlson, the program director at the Stern's History Museum. And I'm very excited today because I have a super special guest with me, my old friend, um, Dr. Alexander Ames, uh, who was a graduate of St. Cloud State University. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself, Alex? Sure, happy to. Well, first off, thanks so much for having me today, Caitlin. It's just a real pleasure to join you for this podcast. Uh, as Caitlin said, my name is Alex Ames, and I grew up in Pine City, Minnesota, not too terribly far from St. Cloud, and I did both my undergraduate degree as well as my first master's degree at SCSU. So I was at St. Cloud State from the summer of 2005 through the summer of 2012. And then after finishing my degree at, at SCSU, I uh, entered into graduate school at the University of Delaware and did two more master's degrees and a PhD at, at Delaware and have since uh, relocated to Philadelphia. And now I work as collections engagement manager uh, in the collections department at the Rosenbach, which is an historic house museum and special collections library affiliated with the Free Library of Philadelphia. So if anyone's interested, I would invite you to uh, go to rosenbach.org and uh, learn a little bit more about the institution and some of the online resources that we've been developing in the last few weeks. Yeah, we could probably do a whole podcast about that. Uh, but instead today, we're going to focus a little bit on, well, completely on your, um, the research you did while you were a graduate student here at Saint, in St. Cloud, um, which is very much based in St. Cloud and also Little Falls. So do you want to talk Give us a general description of what that research was and also maybe what drew you to that uh, research idea. Sure. So as you mentioned, I, I, really, I really had no intention when I enrolled uh, at SCSU, spe uh, specifically in the public history master's program, of you know, really specializing in local and regional history, except for the fact that you know, as a student at SCSU, and this is an experience that I'm sure many people who have attended the university would probably uh, share, you know, I spend a lot of time, of course, walking around campus, exploring the South Side neighborhood, the residential neighborhood in the immediate vicinity of the campus, and, you know, being someone who's fond of architecture, fond of uh, social and cultural history, I became really interested in the beautiful residential architecture in that little part of town and especially became sort of curious about the um, relationship between the university which obviously had grown up within this residential neighborhood and the uh, local community that had immediately surrounded this uh, college you know in in the south side neighborhood so that became a, a source of great interest to me. I especially became fascinated by one particular property, the uh, Whitney House, uh, located at 524 First Avenue South uh, on the campus of St. Cloud State University, which those of you who know St. Cloud well, it's a beautiful, grand, sort of Georgian revival mansion, early 20th century mansion, uh, located uh, on First Avenue on the, the banks of the Mississippi and now on the campus of St. Cloud State. So I became really interested in the, the story of this part of the community and the implications of that story for the, the, the city of St. Cloud in the present, because it, it's quite clear that the, the history and future of the university, the history and the future of the South Side neighborhood bear mightily on the well-being of St. Cloud as a community. So that was, a, that was one aspect of my, of my research. That alone could have been the entirety of a, of a master's thesis. But what ended up happening was sort of through a series of uh, unplanned events, I ended up spending a fair amount of time uh, while in graduate school at SCSU up in Little Falls. I, had, uh, I, was, I did a couple internships at various institutions up there and really became fascinated by the different civic culture and, and the different relationship with local heritage that I felt in Little Falls as compared to St. Cloud, mostly uh, as encapsulated in the Linden Hill estate, which is the historic Weyerhaeuser and Musser estate of approximately 10 acres. Mm -hmm. 
uh, located on the banks of the Mississippi River in, in Little Falls. And it's this important site in Little Falls collective memory. And so as I was bouncing back and forth between taking classes at SCSU, you know, working at the university as a graduate assistant, and then spending time in Little Falls, I, I decided to focus my research on trying to do a sort of comparative community study, looking at why did St. Cloud end up with its own sort of relationship with its history, with its local heritage, and why did Little Falls end up going down a somewhat different path? And the basic you know, conclusion that I sort of came to, and this is of no surprise to those who live in central Minnesota, is that St. Cloud has a really different relationship with history and with the past as embodied in architecture and sort of um, community heritage than does Little Falls. And the whole purpose of my project was really to try to unravel why that was the case. Okay. So for, to, as a representative of the South Side in St. Cloud, you focused on um, the Whitney's and Mrs. Alice Whitney in particular. Um, was, there, was it just because you were drawn to that specific house um, in that neighborhood or was there something about Mrs. Whitney that symbolized this idea that you were trying to analyze? What was it that really drew you to the Whitney's? Well, their family story, the story of that house and the long-term ramifications that the acquisition of the Whitney's had for the South Side neighborhood and for the university, um, they really encapsulate and tell the story of the South Side neighborhood. And I'll, without you know, diving into too many complex details, I'll just sort of e explain why that is the case and specifically why and how the Whitney family ended up in St. Cloud. Sure. So, you know, sort of the, the general history of St. Cloud is pretty well known that it grew up in the 1850s uh, sort of in, as an incorporated city out of three smaller settlements on the banks of the Mississippi River when St. Cloud was still sort of a quote unquote frontier community. Uh, one of these smaller settlements was called Lower Town, one was called Middle Town, and one was called Upper Town. Um, the most important for our story uh, being Lower Town which is the part of uh, St. Cloud, which, which today is known as the, as the South Side neighborhood where the university is. Uh, Lower Town was by and large south of a ravine that ran from Lake George over to the Mississippi River and drained into the Mississippi. And so in sort of early days, that ravine was an important geographic dividing point between Lower Town and then Middle Town to the north, which was centered on St. Germain Street. Lower Town became very distinctive in early St. Cloud history because that was thought to be probably where the most economic vitality would be in this set of settlements. And so a lot of the early uh, settlers, the early prominent settlers, Protestant Yankees and uh, people from the mid-Atlantic region of the United States who are some of the early business people, early settlers of early white settlers of this uh, area came to Lower Town and settled there. Now, of course, what ended up happening was that Lower Town did not become the sort of the commercial center of, of, of a United St. Cloud. That became St. Germain Street, that became Middletown. So Lower Town became by and large a residential area. It, be, it remained uh, associated heavily with the sort of Anglo-Saxon Protestant crowd, uh, early people from the early, early settlers from the East Coast who became some of the, what were considered sort of the pioneer families, the first elite families of this early settlement. Now the demographics of St. Cloud shifted quite dramatically as the 19th century wore on and became largely, of course, a, a German Catholic uh, era, uh, city, uh, region, uh, with this sort of remaining stronghold of sort of elite socioeconomically prosperous Protestants who lived in a very beautiful uh, neighborhood in what now we call the South Side. The really sort of affluent Tony part of this neighborhood was 
sort of concentrated near the river. Uh, and if you think of the south side today as sort of you know, being between Division, the Mississippi to the east, Ninth Avenue uh, to the west, and then Tenth Street down south, it, it's you know, a sort of a rough re rectangle. It's, it's really the up the northeastern part of that neighborhood that was considered a very, you know, um, patrician place mm -hmm. to live. Well two families that ended up having a presence in early-ish St. Cloud history in the, in the 1880s, 1890s, were the, the Wheelock family and the Whitney family. So the Wheelocks were represented by two sisters uh, who came to St. Cloud, one uh, to teach at the normal school, uh, Min was her sort of her nickname, she taught Latin and civil government at the, at the St. Cloud Normal School, which had been founded in 1869. Because she was uh, working at the Normal School as a faculty member, her younger sister, named Alice Wheelock, came uh, from the family home in upstate New York and uh, attended the St. Cloud Normal School. She came in 18, 1886, 1885, 1886, around there. And then in 1887, Another person of New England background uh, who had, whose family had come to Minnesota um, uh, named Albert Whitney, A.G. Whitney, ended up moving to St. Cloud. He, had, he was born on a farm, but ended up sort of you know, developing some business interests. And he ended up coming uh, and living in St. Cloud in 1887. Alice Wheelock was quite elegant, sophisticated, you know, a, a young woman of some social standing in the still comparatively young community. And she had no shortage of suitors. There were several men interested in uh, courting her. Mm -hmm. And let's just put it this way, thinking in terms of her own future well-being as a married woman, she ended up choosing quite well yeah. and <laughs> uh, married uh, A.G. Whitney, as he became known. And basically, uh, the Whitney family became the leading business family in St. Cloud, the leading social family in the city, uh, and really embodied in this one family the um, heritage of Lower Town. They were, they were Presbyterians. They were extremely, extremely well-to-do, uh, especially sort of in the local milieu. A.G. Whitney basically... Um, really made a fortune by coming to predominate in the streetcar industry in St. Cloud, as well as electricity. So he started off as many early business people did in, in the 19th century in real estate, loans, finance, that sort of thing. But then really st strategically grew into streetcars and electricity. And so needless to say, that was a wise path to take. And he, he did very, very well. And so they had built their house, they built a house on First Avenue, you know, in, in the late 19th century. And it was a sort of a Victorian, you know, perfectly nice home. But then in 1916, they ended up uh, building a new home on that same site. They moved their old house off the property and on that same site, you know, overlooking the Mississippi River, built this quite grand almost palatial, you know, Georgian revival residence that stands there today. It's an impressive home today, uh, even surrounded by very, very large university buildings. You can imagine what it would have looked like in its time in 1916 when it was first constructed. It was a, a grand home in the latest style um, and very different from a lot of the Victorian homes around it. And it was on a very sizable parcel of land with beautiful oak trees. It was very bucolic. And, you know, the Whitney's owned the property sweeping down to the Mississippi River. And so they were sort of, I, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say they were probably the most prominent family in St. Cloud in terms of society, business, culture. They were, they were really it in terms of well-to-do local families. Right, and unfortunately, they didn't get to share that house together for very long, right? It wasn't long after that that Mr. Whitney passed away, so it kind of became this home where Mrs. Whitney 
enjoyed her widowhood, I guess you could say, um, but yeah. not, when did St. Cloud State really start encroaching into that whole area and how did it kind of change the, what was once this very affluent neighborhood? Yeah, well, first I'll follow up on, uh, on that first point you made. You're quite right. A.G. Whitney died quite young. I believe he was 62 when he, when he died. He was actually attending the wedding of his son, Wheelock Whitney Sr. in Portland, Maine. And he had a heart condition and was advised against taking the trip out to Maine for the wedding, but needless to say, wanted to be at his son's wedding. He died in Portland, Maine in 1922. So you can imagine they had very few years in this huge house together. And then, you know, uh, Alice Whitney and her children were left to, you know, um, sort of be in this home. Uh, and, and most of her widowhood, of course, was spent living there by herself. So she spent upwards, of, she, she died in 1954. So she spent from 1922 to 1954 in this absolutely mammoth mm -hmm. home, you know, very grand home. Uh, living by by her, her herself, you know, and entertaining frequently, of course, but um, they they did not have long in the house together. So you raise a really interesting other question about when the university started to sort of be a, a presence in in the neighborhood. And the bottom line is, from day one of the normal school. Um, the, 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 the normal school, which became the teacher's college, which became St. Cloud State, has been a vital and important presence in the South Side neighborhood. As a matter of fact, and this is a point that I find to be so ironic about the eventual history of sort of the school really taking over a lot of land in the neighborhood as, as, as it grew, um, in the 1860s, a lot of uh, movers and shakers in Lower Town, in the South Side, desperately fought to win the the, the normal school for the for, for for Lower Town. So what ended up happening was when um, the state legislature had decided that th there would be a normal school in St. Cloud, each of the different settlements realized that this would be a, an economic advantage to have the school placed in the boundaries of the old settlement, be it Lower Town or Middle Town. And so there was a bit of a, um, an effort on both parts to sort of win the normal school for the different parts of the, of, of the community. While Lower Town ended up winning, it be, uh, the, the state acquired the Stearns Hotel, uh, and that became sort of the, the base of, of the school. And for many decades, the, the normal school and the teacher's college were of, of a size that it, they were not out of place in the, in, the, in the residential neighborhood. So from 1869, really, through the uh, Second World War, so in, in that significant chunk of time, the school never grew to a size that made it a bad fit with, with a residential neighborhood. The, the, the number of students was never so large. The number of faculty and staff was never so large that it would really overwhelm the, the neighborhood. And, of, and actually quite the contrary, you know, for a, a neighborhood comprised of um, people who value cultural opportunities, uh, concerts, music, that sort of thing, you know, a lot of the old lower town elite actually really smiled on having this educational institution in the neighborhood. Many university administrators, many uh, students lived in, in, the, in the neighborhood, many faculty lived in the neighborhood. And so they were part of this set of, you know, people who, who enjoyed culture and they interacted with the sort of business elite who still made their homes specifically between First Avenue and Fifth Avenue in that upper part of the neighborhood. Now, of course, you know, what, what ended up happening was after the Second World War, when there was a dramatic increase in the number of people seeking higher education through such efforts as the GI Bill, you started to see an absolute, you know, a, a skyrocketing enrollment at St. Cloud Teachers College. And so, so that sort of one bump when there was a dramatic increase. 
Well, then another big bump came with the baby boom and the arrival of a, a lot more students in the 1960s. So it was at that time that the university began expanding west. Now, it wasn't for or sort of preordained that it was going to have to be this way. As a matter of fact, uh, university administrators, namely President George Budd, had put forth a proposal actually to move the, the college to a different site because it became very clear that there wasn't a whole lot of space to grow where the school currently was. You know, for most of its history, you know, pre-World War II, um, almost the entirety of the normal school, the teacher's college, remained, uh, it, it almost completely remained um, to the east of First Avenue. Most of the big university buildings did not push out into the neighborhood. All of that began to change when uh, Bud and others were unable to convince the legislature to move the, the entire university, the entire college, to a different site. So that uh, basically meant that if the school were going to grow, it would have to push into the surrounding residential neighborhood. And so it, the, the process unfolded very quickly uh, in the years following the Second World War. And by 1965, basically the school had already sort of marched uh, over to Fourth Avenue and to sort of become a much larger institution. Now, all of this, you know, to, to be sure the university, the, the growth of the school was probably the biggest single variable in the uh, sort of path that the South Side neighborhood has taken. But one of the most, most interesting things that I uncovered in my research is that it's not the whole story. And the reason I say that is because the foundation of economic, cultural, and sort of religious eliteness on which the old lower town um, gentry, so to speak, sat, had begun to sort of ossify and crumble, quite regardless of the university. You know, St. Cloud became a very different city uh, in the first few decades of the 20th century with, with sort of economic expansion. You know, it became a very Roman Catholic city um, and this old Protestant elite, you know, really they were not in a position of sort of hegemony. Uh, and so it's interesting because as the generations rolled on, um, you know, Mrs. Whitney's social caste, um, while still important and while there were still descendants around, you know, this wasn't the predominating cultural force in the city anymore. Interestingly enough, Mrs. Whitney herself never minded the growth of the university. And quite the contrary, actually rather reveled in it. She was not a woman to get caught up in sentiment. She was very forward looking. She was, I mean, it's interesting, of course, her major, one of her major philanthropic contributions to St. Cloud was do, two donations of land for the construction of airports. Mm -hmm. So she, she's very much a forward looking person. And she really enjoyed the hubbub of collegiate life. Of course, she came to St. Cloud to be a student at the normal school. Twice, she decided to build a house right next door. You know, even in 1916, when she built her house, at that point, the school wasn't huge, but she, she was right next door even then. So she really didn't mind. And quite, as a matter of fact, quite enjoyed the... Um, the, the, the being in that area. So, um, you know, she herself was very forward looking, but as, you know, as the 20th century wore on, the cultural balance of that neighborhood really began to shift. And so today what you end up with, of course, is a part of town that combines university buildings, inst large institutional structures with these little reminders of what that neighborhood was. 
at a much earlier point, basically exactly one century ago, you know, in 1920, when it's sort of at its height, the, the old um, uh, sort of lower town elite and their immediate descendants living in rather grand circumstances uh, in, in what was a very bucolic residential neighborhood. So you don't have, you know, a group of people that's super passionate or has any power to really fight to preserve any of these buildings. Is, is that fair to say? Or any reason to? I think that I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that there were no people sort of who were interested in defending or preserving or uh, people who didn't recognize what was happening. Quite the contrary, there were many okay. people who regretted what was happening in the South Side, um, regretted what was happening in other parts of the city where important pieces of local architecture were being demolished to make way for, you know, more um, more roads, better roads, new buildings that could better serve an emerging economy. But I think the bottom line is that you know, St. Cloud in the mid 20th century is an extremely um, prosperous city. It's growing, its economy is growing, the city itself is expanding in new directions. And so the balance between interest in preservation and interest in expanding local economic opportunity, you know, really tilted in the favor of um, e economic opportunity. And something that I think is maybe impossible to prove, but something that I wonder is because those early families who lived in Lower Town were somewhat disconnected from what became this much larger population, you know, did that mean that those homes didn't really resonate as important historic sites for a lot of other people in the city by the time their fate had to be decided? And I think that's, I think it's possible. Again, I think it's really hard to say with any certainty, but mm -hmm. I've often wondered, you know, hypothetically speaking, you know, let's say a family like the Whitney's had lived in a much smaller town and built a house of this nature, would, would, the, would the house have a different place in, in local memory? I don't know. But I think that the bottom line is, you know, economic forces really drove the change. And the fact that the school was growing, which, you know, let's not cover up the fact that what that meant was that many, many people were able to attain higher education, who otherwise otherwise may not have been able to. So on the one hand, of course, the preservationist in me thinks how sad that many of these structures ended up being demolished. On the other hand, you know, it, it, progress, so to speak, proved beneficial for many. Many of the homes in the South Side, namely the, the uh, homes of the Mitchell family, were demolished before the uh, the normal school or one of the home, one of the Mitchell family houses was demolished before the normal school, uh, and then the you know what, what became the teachers' college really expanded. So it's a complex story, but suffice to say that the you know economic interest of the city shifted such that some of those grand old residences mm -hmm. uh, in in the in the neighborhood uh, made way for for different buildings and for different uses. Yeah, and especially when you think about you know, pr historic preservation was not at the top of people's minds at, in that time period you're speaking of, right after World War II. Economic prosperity was at the top of people's minds. So it, it makes sense in that regard as well. Um, but you were talking about comparing it to what happened in Little Falls, which is a story I had not read before and I thought was extremely fascinating. So do you want to tell us a little bit of background about the Little Falls story? Sure. So it, it actually makes the story of Little Falls and the Linden Hill Estate, about which I'll tell you more in a moment, makes for a wonderful comparison to what was happening in the South Side. And a, a brief thumbnail sketch of the sort of the economic history of Little Falls reveals why. So, you know, Little Falls and St. Cloud in some ways have a lot in common. They're both river towns on the banks of the Mississippi River. They both um, had their roots in the mid-19th 
century. And you know, both had a lot of sort of similar assets in the sense that they're located in central Minnesota, you know, when they were emerging in the uh, mid 19th century, had opportunities to become commercial and business centers for their surrounding rural hinterlands. Well, the, the history, uh, the, the, the early history of Little Falls was very auspicious indeed in terms of its possible economic growth potential. Reason being, in uh, the late 19th century, uh, this was the era when the Minnesota Northwoods became prime real estate for lumbermen. And before that time, I mean, of course, the history of the lumber industry in America is that, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the parts of the country open to lumbering really depends on how far, you know, white settlement had moved west. So for the first several decades of the 19th century, you know, it was, it was really um, Wisconsin uh, and then um, the, sort of the, the lower half of Minnesota, the St. Croix River Valley, that was open to, to lumbering. As the 19th century wore on, uh, the, in, in the last couple decades of the 19th century, the Minnesota North Woods became more easily accessible and thus prime real estate, of course, for harvesting white pine. So the Weyerhaeuser Lumbering Syndicate, which was, you know, Frederick Weyerhaeuser was a German immigrant who was the really leading lumber figure in this period in um, American history, began, you know, acquiring interests in northern Minnesota and basically had to find a place uh, in a, a town in Minnesota that was, would serve as the base of Weyerhaeuser operations, bringing, you know, freshly harvested uh, lumber from uh, the North Woods down the river, down the Mississippi, you know, saw it and then bring it to market. And so there was, needless to say, intense competition about which city or town would come to host the, the, the warehousers and their lumbering interests. And this involved, you know, many different river towns wanted this opportunity. Minneapolis was a contender. Uh, St. Cloud was a contender. Little Falls was a contender. And, you know, I think it would be like if, you know, Microsoft or Amazon or, you know, a, a big tech company were going to announce a, a major new uh, regional headquarters. You, know, you can imagine how economic development people would be just clamoring to get their attention. It well, exactly worked just a couple years ago, right? Didn't that just happen where they were, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Just a couple of years ago, Amazon, you know, famously um, basically put out a call for proposals. Well, you know, Weyerhaeuser, what that the lumber was this sort of important industry in this in this period. So what happened was Little Falls ended up getting the nod and became the uh, headquarters of the uh, sort of the, the, the Weyerhaeuser operations uh, in this region. The lumber industry operated in a very complex way. It was very family oriented, largely because of the, geog the geographical component of the trade and the multiple different sort of operations that had to go into harvesting and delivering, you know, processing and delivering lumber. So what happened was Frederick Weyerhaeuser ended up sending, you know, four of his sons to different parts of Minnesota to deal with different different business interests. Well, he sent um, a man named Charles Weyerhaeuser to Little Falls to be to sort of manage the operations of a, of a company called the Pine Tree Lumber Company that was incorporated in Iowa and then um, you know, operated in Little Falls to process the millions of board feet of lumber that would come down the river every season. He brought with him a friend uh, from a sort of connected lumber dynasty, uh, a, a man named Richard Drew Musser. The Mussers of Muscatine, Iowa, were also very important uh, lumbermen, uh, but not as important as the Weyerhaeuser. So you sort of had this system you know, where different families occupied different levels of status. Well, anyway, so they set up shop 
in Little Falls, and you know, you should read the newspaper accounts from this period in Little Falls. I mean, you know, they're thinking this is it. We're going to be we're the next Minneapolis. Nothing can stand in our way. We're going to be a great metropolis on the Mississippi River. Now, of course, there's a level to which this is boosterism. Of course, I mean, 19th century newspapers aren't exactly noted for their calmness of tone, but you know, they were sort of glossing over a fact which was already well known in you know the the late 19th century and the early 20th century that yes the lumber industry brings great prosperity to a to a town where it sets up shop but it doesn't stay there long the whole organizing principle of the lumber trade is that you go to a place you harvest all the lumber, and then when there's no more, when there are no more trees that you want, you move on to the next place. I mean, this is why Weyerhaeuser went from Illinois to Wisconsin to Minnesota. Well, what happened was they set up shop in Little Falls, and you know, for some years brought the prosperity to the town that was anticipated. It was a very successful company. Um, Charles Weyerhaeuser and Richard Drew Musser, you know, reigned over local high society with their wives. Uh, they were sort of benevolent, you know, well-to-do business people, not unlike the Whitney's in St. Cloud and, and their sort of south side, lower town set. But before long, the signs became clear that the Weyerhaeusers weren't going to stay there forever because you know, Minnesota's uh, supplies of white pine ran low, and so the Weyerhaeusers very, you know, not too terribly long after settling down, ended up, you know, heading out west uh, to the Pacific Northwest and, you know, finding other um, troves of, of timber. So that's what, that's what happened. And it, in 1920, the Pine Tree Lumber Company closed down. So how this unfolded then was that, um, the Weyerhaeuser family left Little Falls. The Musser family stayed behind. They had built uh, a beautiful estate called Linden Hill, two homes on the property designed by the famous Minnesota architect Clarence Johnston, which gives you a sense of just how well to do these families were. Many homes on Summit Avenue were designed by Clarence Johnston. He's a, a big deal, of course, in terms of local regional architectural history. So when the Weyerhaeusers left, the, the Mussers remained on this gorgeous estate. And Richard Drew Musser sort of had other business interests. He stayed involved in uh, uh, banking locally. He was involved in the, the lumber yard and lived out his life at, in, very in comfort, uh, dying in the 50s, I wanna say 58. And it was really his daughter, Laura Jane Musser, who makes this story rather different. So the, the, that first generation of Mussers and Weyerhausers, I mean, it reads a lot like these early well-to-do families in St. Cloud, but it was the work of Laura Jane Musser, the daughter of Richard Drew Musser and his wife, Sarah, who put Lyndon Hill on rather a different course from what we saw emerge in the south side of St. Cloud. Right, so the story of Laura Jane is really, to me, the, the most interesting part of the tale, um, considering the work she put in to preserve this house, or estate, I guess, um, when it wasn't exactly a place she had fond memories of. So I don't, if, do you just wanna tell the story of what she did to put the place on the map and give it the status it has now as a historic home and a event venue and that sort of thing? Sure. So. Laura Jane Musser was born in 1916. She was the only surviving biological child of Richard Drew Musser and his wife, Sarah. She, needless to say, was heiress to an immense fortune, to, a, to an exalted position in Minnesota high society, really national high society. I mean, you know, these are, she, she truly was uh, at the very top of the social heap. She was someone who throughout her life struggled to fit in easily. 
And this, you know, I, I say that with great compassion because she's one of my personal heroes. She, and I'll, 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 I'll explain more as to why in a moment, but um, she was someone, especially in small town Minnesota, despite her status, you know, was not a good fit. She said throughout her, her life, and this is something she carried with her into adulthood, that her mother had wanted her to fit into a, a sort of um, mold of what a, an upper class young woman should be. And Laura Jane never really did. She was extremely intelligent. She was tempestuous. She was strong-headed, strong-willed, and um, a person of great passion. And you know, to make a long and complex story short, you know, her life was both defined by and yet never contained by her family's uh, reputation and legacy in Little Falls. She, uh, after graduating from Little Falls High School, received education on the East Coast, eventually enrolling in Juilliard and spent several years of study at Juilliard. She was a great musician. She had been taught to play piano by her mother. Uh, she spent some of, really much of the 1940s and the early 1950s in New York City, which you can just imagine. I mean, being a young artist in New York in the 1940s and 50s, she knew everyone in New York. She found a, a kind of acceptance and a rich cultural environment in New York City that needless to say, of course, Little Falls was not <laughs> New York. Uh, in terms of cultural opportunity, she also became completely committed during those years to social justice. And this is borne out in the archival record of her life. I mean, she was writing home to her parents talking about you know, the shocking poverty, much, much of it grounded in racial difference, ethnic difference that she was encountering in New York. And you know, think of, think of this, you, rather than turn up her nose or sort of feel bad and move on with her well-to-do life, she became involved in uh, social services efforts in New York. She became a tremendous philanthropist and while in New York really started her lifetime work of using her fortune to support the less fortunate. She donated to social justice causes. She donated to historically black colleges and universities. She did all sorts of work geared toward um, helping people in need and became in the process a, a great patroness of the arts. She supported artists of all backgrounds. She took a, a particular interest in encouraging the careers of young people uh, who could benefit from her, you know, um, both her expertise and her own considerable musical talent, as well as her family standing and, and wealth. It, she, she, she used those assets to help other people uh, achieve their own goals, which they may not have been able to otherwise. Well, she spent probably what were actually the best years of her life in New York City. But in 1953, uh, because of the illness of her mother, came home to Little Falls and then took care of her father until her father's death in 1958. And she spent the rest of her life from 1958 through 1989 with Little Falls as her main place of residence. She traveled extensively. She had an apartment in New York, but Little Falls was her place of residence. She was, just despite her, her fortune um, and despite her um, accomplishments and her education, she remained very um, I don't want to say bitter because I think that might be too strong of a, of a term. She, rem she had a lot of complex emotions tied up in her family's heritage and in the way that, and in her youth, in her childhood. And it set up this really interesting situation where her life was spent within the, the boundaries of her estate at Linden Hill, 
She lived in the Weyerhaeuser house. She said that her family home, the Musser residence, because there are these two mansions, the, the, the home where she grew up was too emotionally fraught for her. So she lived in the Weyerhaeuser house and understood their historical importance, preserved them, took care of the properties, especially with the Musser residence, locked the door and no one went in there for decades, basically. And preserved these homes, understood their importance, you know, felt somewhat, you know, vindictive toward her family's, so the way that she had been treated, and yet could never leave them behind either. There's no reason she couldn't have spent her, the rest of her life in New York City after her father died, but she stayed in Little Falls. What did she do in those houses, especially the, the Weyerhaeuser house? She basically devoted her life to community service. She taught piano lessons free of charge to Little Falls children. She taught dance lessons. She built a whole little studio in the basement of the Weyerhaeuser mansion where students could come and take classes from her. She brought in celebrities. She brought Van Cliburn to Little Falls. She brought Marian Anderson an icon of American music history, an icon of civil rights. She brought Marian Anderson to Little Falls, Minnesota to perform. She opened these really quite grand homes, or house, because the Musser residence really was somewhat off limits. She opened this estate to the everyday people of Little Falls to experience as children, which is completely remarkable. I mean, when you really think about it, and she was, you know, people loved her, people were kind of nervous around her. She became a sort of this local figure in that she, you know, was both known to be this, you know, wealthy aristocrat who was also somewhat eccentric. That was the word that more than any other, the people who knew her would use to describe her and her local reputation. But what ended up happening was she, through her work, endeared the estate to the people of Little Falls in a way that it might not have been otherwise. Of course, it's associated with the lumber history of Little Falls, and so that makes it an important site. But what really made that property so meaningful to people, I think, and again, this is somewhat a, a, a hypothesis that I came to in my research, is that Laura Jane took this sort of Gilded Age, Downton Abbey-like story and translated it into something where you could look at this woman who has everything and say, you know what, I feel kind of sorry for her, but I so appreciate everything she's done for us. Mm -hmm. And it was a very different relationship that was forged with those houses in Little Falls than what we saw happening in the South Side neighborhood of St. Cloud. Yeah, so I mean, obviously there's a lot of external factors at play, but I like the way that in your research and your thesis that you tied the, the houses to these two women and how Mrs. Whitney was always looking ahead and Laura Jane, for whatever reason, could not help but look back. And therefore, I mean, you can't really say therefore, but her, the house of her family is preserved. And Mrs. Whitney's, it's still there. I guess you can maybe enlighten us about the state of that house. But um, I just think that's interesting that that's the way you describe those two women and that that's the status of their, their legacies or their physical house that they lived in. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's what I find so scintillating about this project. As you say, I mean, we, you can't really prove cause and effect in a situation like this, but what we have is these very human stories, um, especially with Laura Jane Musser, but also with the Whitney's. You know, I mean, they're, these, they're, they are individual people and yet what we see, the forces at work in their own lives are also somewhat reflected in the communities they call home. And I think it, you don't have to spend a lot of time exploring Little Falls and exploring St. Cloud to start to get the sense that, you know, St. Cloud or Little Falls has a level of sort of curbside appeal of historic charm that is somewhat 
that leads to a very different local sort of resonance than what we have in St. Cloud in terms of um, the, the, the historic nature uh, of uh, and sort of the state of preservation of much of the community. And so while it's not, you know, I, I would never go so far as to, you know, claim a direct causal relationship, I think that, you know, community identity, community culture is, it exists, even though it's sort of intangible, it's invisible, but we see that um, at work in, in both of these different communities. Can you tell us what the Whitney House, um, is it a historic house? What is the situation there today? Sure, so I'm happy to. I first, uh, let's sort of rewind a little bit because I wanna start by sharing with you a quote from um, a well-known St. Cloud figure named Glanville Smith. Uh, anyone you know, who spent much time at the Stearns History Museum certainly knows that name. He was an important chronicler of the cultural history of Stearns County and knew Mrs. Whitney and the Whitney family quite well. He was a contemporary, younger, young enough really to be Mrs. Whitney's son, but was a, a good friend of her and shall we say very much valued the relationship with her because you know he he was one of the a member of sort of an old lower town south side family as well and so after mrs whitney died in 1954 if i recall correctly glanville smith you know, wrote in in his journal about um sort of the, a reception held following mrs whitney's funeral uh, the reception being held at the Whitney House, uh, and, and he had this to say about sort of the end of an era in, in Southside history. He said, and I quote, the house is to be kept open a couple of months more. We shall see Lois and perhaps some of the others again for a while, uh, referring to Mrs. Whitney's children. But then the old hospitable address with its style, rich and tasteful elegance and cordial welcome will be closed and there's the end of it for which I am heartily sorry. So Glenville Smith had a feeling, and right, rightfully, I mean, it was, I'm sure, brutally obvious that the passing of Alice Whitney, who was sort of this grand dame of local society, marked the end of this era in Southside history. And already by the time Mrs. Whitney died, the teacher's college was expanding all around her. Um, there was no questioning the fact that the school was really expanding geographically in the Southside neighborhood. Um, the, the Whitney family had been approached by the Diocese of St. Cloud about acquiring the property, of acquiring Mrs. Whitney's house. And for whatever reason, the diocese ended up not purchasing the home. They wanted, wanted to use it as a student center for members of the Catholic faith who were attending. The, uh, the, the college. Well, what ended up happening was the state of Minnesota acquired the home uh, from the heirs of Mrs. Whitney. Basically, the heirs uh, sold the house to the state of Minnesota at half price, sort of at a 50% discount for its actual value. And the, you know, it's sort of a complicated story, but the, there was some hope and some talk early when this was being negotiated that the house would serve as a president's residence for the president of the, of the college, which, I mean, I, it certainly would fit the purpose, right? I mean, so this gorgeous grand house. Well, it ended up being acquired to be used as a dormitory. Again, lucky you know, young ladies who had the opportunity to live in this house, which until recently had been you know, the finest, most elite address in St. Cloud High Society. So, it, and that's the function that the house served for some years, it was a dormitory. And there are beautiful pictures, you know, from the 50s when, you know, college students were living there. You know, it still had all of its you know, beautiful opulence intact and then it was being used for this new purpose. Well, what ended up happening was in 1964, if I recall correctly, the president of St. Cloud State decided uh, to enact what he thought was the initial 
desire of all parties involved and, and, and would use the Whitney House as a president's residence. Now, you know, we're, we're in the mid 60s and this, let's just say, did not go down well <laughs> once the news became public for a number of reasons. I mean, you know, I, the devil's in the details, of course, sort of what set off uh, sort of a series of controversial decisions uh, about this, you know, using public money to do some refurbishments on the home in preparation for its being used as a president's residence. But essentially what happened was it, it was deemed at the state level, you know, at the uh, sort of state government level, inappropriate for this home, which was you know, purchased by the state of Minnesota. It wasn't an outright gift. It was purchased by the state of Minnesota uh, for use as a dormitory. Uh, it, it was deemed inappropriate that the property should be used as a president's residence. George Budd, I mean, they, they were already unpacking the China <laughs> in the cabinets. You know, by the time that this all became well known publicly, it has sort, sort of stirred a controversy. And essentially, you know, Budd had to vacate the premises. I mean, he could not end up using it as a president's residence. And he, he was a, shall we say, a grand figure. George Budd um, so oversaw the, an ex the expansion of the university. He was well known in educational circles and um, cut a grand figure. And so it's not exactly surprising that he would want to use the, the Whitney House as a president's residence. So, but it didn't happen. And so basically what ended up happening was after that, I mean, you know, the, the house has been used for a variety of administrative office purposes since it, it, immediately after George Budd left the presidency, it was used as the president's office. So not a residence, but as an executive office, which you know, certainly would lend itself to that as well. But over the years, it's housed various different offices and departments. You know, the house is now quite old. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can imagine it's not necessarily the most commodious and practical office space, even though it's still rather grand in its appearance. I will admit to you, you know, I, I left St. Cloud, I moved from, away from St. Cloud in 2012, so I have really no idea um, how the home is being used or what plans are for it moving forward. I had heard that it's currently not occupied by any office, that it's not currently being used as an office space. I don't know you know, what the what the future of the property will be you know it's um sort of an interesting dilemma in a way you can read the story of of george budd and the the whole controversy about using the house as a president's residence in two ways at least two ways on the one hand you know it, it it's a huge mansion and the teacher's college is, is a public university or public school and so you know there was some rightful indignation at the thought of um, you know, this basically the public supporting this very grand lifestyle on the other hand you know thinking a little more deeply many college and university presidents have official residences and I think and I recall you know when doing this research one thing that came to my mind is you know, doesn't St. Cloud State, in this, in this case, the Teachers College, you know, do you sort of deserve to have a ceremonial space of this nature, um, of this beautiful, you know, very elegant Georgian, you know, it has a very collegiate feel, so it's a beautiful building. Um, I think that there's more to it than just mm -hmm. the, the question of um, hubris or, um, you know, gr grandiose lifestyle, there's more to it than that. And I think you know, it says a lot about sort of the, the educational politics as well, about use of the building. But it, it is, you know, Alice, Alice Whitney was referred to as the grand old lady of St. Cloud. I think the Whitney house today really is a grand old lady in and, in and of itself. Um, it's, you know, I, I can imagine, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a university administrator, I'm not a facilities expert. I'm sure it poses a lot of challenges in terms of the practicalities of 
um, that building as office space or as any sort of you know, practical university space, but it sure is a treasure. It sure is beautiful. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt spent the night there. She wrote a, news, a newspaper column, her, her syndicated My Day, sort of diary of her, do, of her travels. Um, she wrote and published a, about Mrs. Whitney's house in 1941, shortly before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Oh, um, wow. It's associated with, that house is associated with many important stories in St. Cloud history. And it's a beautiful testament to the, uh, you know, with, maybe I risk falling into a sort of sentimentality here, but it's, it's, an, it's an elegant space, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, it tells um, elegant stories about St. Cloud history and about the history of the university that are important. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even though they, they feel very distant at this point, it's a, it's a very um, significant place in our local history. Yeah, well, it's a place I don't think I've ever set foot in, so I was just curious about its uses since Mrs. Whitney has passed on. Um, well, you also tell elegant stories, Alex, so thank you so much for, for that wonderful history. Um, I know you have a book coming out. Um, it is your doctorate, or it's based on your doctorate, is that correct? It is called The Word in the Wilderness. Do you want to tell people kind of what it's about? Sure, I would love to. So I sort of made a, a sharp turn in my uh, scholarly <laughs> research when I ended up moving to Delaware to do my PhD and wrote about a topic quite removed from that which we just discussed, but something that I think many in Stearns County may actually find of some interest. I wrote my dissertation on the religious history of early German-speaking settlers of Pennsylvania who came to the colony uh, between 1683 and 1775 and uh, created many beautiful religious manuscripts. These were by and large German Protestants who settled in Pennsylvania in that period. They made really beautiful religious devotional artworks. And I ended up doing a sort of um, religious history of the art of, man of calligraphy and manuscript production in Pennsylvania between roughly uh, 1683 through about 1855 or so. And I, it's the sort of art form that I, even though these individuals, you know, um, were of Protestant background, I think anyone familiar with the strong German Catholic heritage uh, in, in central Minnesota and Stearns County, and anyone familiar with sort of the, you know, the medieval art of manuscript illumination will find interesting and sort of an interesting point of connection that hasn't really been explored before. So the book is called The Word in the Wilderness, Popular Piety and the Manuscript Arts in Early Pennsylvania. It will be published by the Pennsylvania State University Press and is scheduled for release in June. It's available for pre-order on Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and other booksellers. And if anyone's interested in learning more about it, I would invite you to visit the book's companion website, wordinwilderness.com, and uh, explore that topic as well. Awesome. That sounds very interesting. That's a lot different reading stuff from 17th century than reading some 20th century documents, I bet. Um, but equally fascinating. So um, is there anything else you want to share with our audience? I appreciate your time. It was pretty interesting to hear all of that. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's just such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you today, Caitlin, and to, to revisit this topic, which I admit, you know, I, um, after moving away to continue my education and start my career, I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about this topic or these topics. Uh, in, in recent years, so it's been tremendous fun to to explore uh, some of these familiar characters and to, to think through these issues again. And I, you know, still am so fond of um, all of my memories of working in, in the South Side, doing this research, and spending time in Little Falls. And um, always enjoy coming back to visit. So it's been a real pleasure to have the opportunity to connect with you again. Well, again, I appreciate it. And I hope a lot of our listeners appreciate it too. I know they will. So uh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, and good luck with everything. And hopefully we won't be doing Zoom meetings forever and we'll see each other in person someday soon. <laughs> I, I do hope so. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Yep. Bye.